Now, if you've watched my channel at all in the past, you're well aware I make a lot of response videos. As a matter of fact, that's what got me to get off my butt and make my first videos about this stuff was when I saw Milo Rossi and Stefan Milo misrepresenting Graham Hancock's position and just kind of getting things wrong. I was like, you know what? I need to make a video about this. And, you know, almost two years later, here we are, me talking to you about making response videos and you listening going, yeah, Dan makes response videos, that's what he does. And usually, the people that I make response videos to, they kind of suck. I mean, usually there's a reason, right? Usually they just got something wrong or they're being butthole or misrepresenting something or sometimes they're just downright dishonest. But this time, we got an entirely different situation. But this time, I'm talking about somebody that I actually have some respect for, a Metatron. And, and I like him because of a couple things. One, he's not afraid to say, call it like he sees it, even if he knows it's going to piss people off. Something that I find near and dear to my heart. Something else that he does that I appreciate a lot is when he does call people out, he's polite about it, generally speaking. Unless they're openly dishonest or something like that, he's usually pretty polite. And that I also appreciate a lot, because in this video, we're going to watch him disagree with Graham Hancock, and Graham Hancock's talking to Lex Friedman here, and, and Metatron disagrees with him at times. But he's polite about it, he's not rude about it, he certainly doesn't imply that Graham's as dumb as a flat earther or anything like that, and basically this is a great case study for certain other people out there that are, happen to be academics, that go out of their way to debunk people like Graham and others, Maybe they could learn how to be, you know, less abrasive and, and maybe actually, you know, not alienate people when they do it. That's one thing we could learn here. Another thing that I, I want to point out is I'm going to send this to Metatron when I'm done with it and hopefully it takes time to watch it. There are some things that he could have learned when he was watching this, but he did it much as I'm going to. He just kind of sat down and did a reaction. Now, I'm going to do much the same thing, but I am going to take a little bit of time to kind of flesh it out a tiny bit, edit some, like he edited a little bit, but I'm going to do a little bit more uh, research a tiny bit in places to make sure that, basically to make sure that he's got the direction to go to jump down the rabbit hole. I know he's a scientifically minded person that he's not going to want a bunch of speculative stuff, so I'm going to hand him some, some solid uh, leads so that he can see where some of the mysteries are that even a skeptic like myself can go, you know what, man? I might not believe in ancient high technology, but there are some things here that are pretty freaking weird. So um, that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. It's going to be a little bit different flavor than normal. I'm going to be sitting down here in just a second. So if you like the media shelf, get a, li a load of the comic books now, because pretty soon the only one you'll be able to see is the one you can't really see right now, I think. And one more thing before we start. Thank you to my friend Tim for sending me this here shirt. I, I think... Uh, there you go. You can see right there. Man, I'm buff. But yeah, um, I would turn this into merch, but I believe this guy's a Pokemon or something and, and there's like copyright stuff. So, um, but this is this is a pretty cool shirt. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I wanted to wear it for this year video to, to uh, yeah. But um, thanks, Tim. <sighs> anyway, um, let's get on to the video, right? Hi, my name is Dan and welcome to the Dunking. Hey number ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and today we are back with Lex Friedman podcast and we're going to react and sort of provide commentary to some of the statements that are made by both him and his guests as we always do. I think you understand what he's saying there, if not I can elaborate for you what he's saying, he's getting ready to do a response video and, and if you didn't catch the intro to this video, um, if you've watched my content before you might have seen a response video or two. So this is really the third episode that I'm making about this because, let me show you. I have a few episodes, but specifically with this guest, who is uh, Graham, I finally learned how to pronounce it, Graham Hancock. Uh, as you see, this was my first episode. We, they were introducing the concept of, or the hypothesis of an Ice Age civilization. Then I made a second episode, this one here, where we were discussing the uh, idea of an extinction, global extinction event, or sort of a civilization ending event, and uh, how the sort of ideas that he proposes 
this. And as always, when I listen and react to these things, I always want you to use your own critical thinking. I am, of course, sharing my opinions. Sometimes I'll be like, that's a fascinating theory. Other times I'll be like, no, I don't think that's right. I think that's complete nonsense. You know me. I will say what I think. Well, this was the first one of his videos that I saw. Um, I knew the other ones existed clearly because it shows me right here, but I hadn't seen the other ones yet, so I didn't respond to the other ones. But if you'd like me to, go ahead and let me know. I don't really feel like I need to, though. It's it's not like um, Metatron, like, I don't really feel like I need to just go digging through his stuff. Like I said at the beginning, he, he's pretty chill and polite about it, and I think that we can get most of it done here with just one response to just this one video. And I'm not someone who immediately follows or believes anything anyone says just because they say it confidently and using high-level vocabulary, but because that doesn't necessarily prove that they know what they're talking about, it just proves that they are good speakers at the end of the day. Now, despite my ability to articulate my points quite properly, mispronouncing things is something that is a hallmark of this channel. I do it all the damn time, and there's a reason. Now, that's because um, I do my research, for the most part, by myself. I read by myself. I've been re doing all this stuff without a partner to bounce the ideas off of. Much like my sex life, this is all by myself. But at the same time, I don't also immediately reject anything that doesn't follow the way we understand the past right now, because that would be wrong when it comes to any sort of academic discourse at the end of the day. Any theory, any hypothesis that you decide to present, I'm more than happy to listen. And I don't think that there are that there is any such thing as silly questions or things that you're not supposed to say. No, please, do say it all. Speak freely, is what I say. And he actually follows through with that. Like I said, he, he's not a butthole about this stuff. Pay attention, you'll see. Metatron is not the kind of guy who's going to say, speak freely, and then turn around and be like, but not like that. Well, can you actually describe the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids yeah. and what you find most mysterious and interesting about them? Well, first of all, the astronomy. Uh, and here I, don't like, I, I don't must pay tribute to two individuals, actually three individuals in particular. One of them is John Anthony West, passed away in 2018. He was the first person in our era to begin to wonder if the Sphinx was much older than it had been. Actually, he got that idea from a, from a philosopher called Schwaller de Lubix, who'd noticed what he thought was water erosion on the body of the Sphinx. John West picked that up, and he was a great amateur Egyptologist himself. He's now, this is a great example as to why you should look at these things with an open mind, even if you think you've already done all that. I looked into this stuff for so long that I've got VHS tapes of Mystery of the Sphinx and 1995 copy of Fingerprints of the Gods that I bought when it was brand new. I pre-ordered the damn thing, right? And I still have things to learn. Like this Lupich guy, again, mispronouncing things is kind of a thing that I do. I'd never heard of him. I was unaware that that was where John Anthony West got his ideas from, and that's going to send me down a whole new rabbit hole. And this is why you should have an open mind when you look at these things. You've always got something new to learn, even if you're as smart as me. Spent most of his life in Egypt, and he, he was hugely versed in ancient Egypt. And when he looked at the Sphinx and at the strange scalloped erosion patterns and the vertical fissures, particularly in the trench around the Sphinx, um, he began to think maybe Schwaller was right. Maybe there's, there was some sort, of, some sort of flooding here. And that's when he brought Robert Schock, second person I'd, I'd like to recognize. And now we get to Robert Schock. And it's funny because he's the one who's basically carried this torch and therefore taken all the slings and arrows for this, at least the ones that Graham Hancock hasn't taken himself, for this whole hypothesis. Of course, I've heard of Robert Schock before. Uh, and Schock was the first geologist to stick his neck out, risk the rire, the ire of Egyptologists, and say, well, it looks to me like the Sphinx was exposed to at least a thousand years of heavy rainfall. As Shock's calculations have continued, as he's continued to be immersed in this mystery, he's continuously pushed that back. And he's now, again, looking at the date of around 12,000, 12 and a half thousand years ago, during the Younger Dryas, for the creation of the Great Sphinx. And I well, the ire of Egyptologists doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I challenge oftentimes academics, and I do it publicly, and I point fingers, but I present rece receipts. So that's one thing that I do. And even when I speak sort of outside my field, which I always make clear, um, at the end of the day, I share my opinions, and if they hate me for it, I don't particularly care. With that being said, 
Because once again, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and freedom of debate and discussion, it will always be the cornerstone of advancement. If you are confident and sure about whatever findings that you have, or whatever historical idea that you have presented as the ultimate truth, then you will have no problems with people challenging it, because you'll just debunk them. Piece of cake, right? That's the idea. So if people are like, no, you're not supposed to say, you can't speak, then I'm thinking you're not really confident with your findings. And then you're just trying to protect a narrative. I don't particularly care what academics think of me or any of you when we ask questions. And at the same time, I will strongly side with academics when they have the truth that is confirmed by evidence. And then you have some people that are trying to cancel them because the truth doesn't fit their agendas then I will stand with academia. It's a very case-by-case -case scenario. And now I'm with him here 110%. Um, I too will throw rocks at academics when they're wrong and I've got no problem doing so. And for those of you who are new to the channel. Um, and also I will side with them when they're right. But uh, it's one thing that it's worth pointing out. The last thing that he says there, where the academics, if they're right and they're being tried to be canceled for poking holes in somebody else's narrative, that he'll side with them, and that's where it's important to make sure that people know what the hell the arguments are about, because when they misrepresent these positions, all of a sudden it's easy for them to make that exact argument. Oh, I'm just, I'm just a victim of them trying to cancel me because I made them angry because I disproved Atlantis, when it's like, no, dude, disprove Atlantis all day long. I'm down with that. Just do it above the fucking board. You start cheating... And then we're going to have a problem. You start lying, you start misrepresenting things, we're going to have a problem. And when they say, oh, I wasn't misrepresenting anything, I'm just, I'm just a victim of cancel culture, that's where this kind of thing can be a little, a little tricky because it's not very realistic for, to ask everybody to understand everything, especially in this day and age when they're talking on the internet. I mean, like, here Metatron is just sitting down and doing a reaction video. You think he knows everything about Graham Hancock's positions on all this? Hell no. And then, of course, this is the period of the, of the wet Sahara, the humid Sahara. The Sahara was a completely different place during That's the correct. There were That's correct. In it. There were lakes in it. It was yeah. fertile. It was possibly densely, densely populated. And there was a lot of rain. There's not no rain in Giza today, but there's relatively little rain. The next person, not enough rain to cause that erosion damage on the Sphinx. The next person... Right. Well, I want to make sure that Metatron or Raffaello, I believe that's how you pronounce his real name. In, in case you have, didn't hear me earlier, I'm, I'm often mispronouncing things. But um, I want to make sure that he's got the right idea about this. So I, I will point out that... Um, the reaction to the erosion hypothesis has been like a lot has been pretty pronounced because most geologists didn't have a real issue it seems until the archaeologists and historians were like hey dude do you realize the implications of this and they're like oh, oh fucking hang on a sec and one of the arguments that does potentially hold water but on is uh, the water wicking thing that like water is um, absorbed from the ground up through that bedrock and that it condenses and then runs down and creates erosion. Now, uh, most geologists like Robert Schock that were already on board with the other thing are not into it at all. As a matter of fact, there's a lot, there's, um, from what I've heard, and I haven't researched this one, so I'll either put a link down below or say I'm trying to link, or it's a kind of rabbit hole you could just jump into yourself. Um, that they sent images of that Robert Schock sent images of that uh, erosion from the Sphinx enclosure to other geologists and asked them what it was, and they unanimously were like, "Oh, that's you know erosion from rainfall." And then he told them what it was, and they're like, "Oh shit!" Now again, I don't know for sure if that's true or not. That could be just a story that I heard because I did not look into that. But at any rate, it does look very much like rainfall and water erosion. However, as I said, geologists have other explanations for it. It is actually a very hotly contested topic in the geological sphere and has put Robert Schock, that and some other things, have put Robert Schock kind of well outside of the mainstream geological community as far as these kinds of things go he's a teacher still and whatnot don't get me wrong he hasn't been blackballed for everything but uh, the, a lot of people just kind of look at his work and are like mm, i don't know now, i like the guy personally but i figure it's worth pointing out that the other opposing school of thought isn't just 
cannot possibly be 10,000 years. It cannot possibly be 10,000 years because Waterwick. The next person right. who needs to be mentioned in this context is, is Robert Boval. Uh, Robert and I have co-authored a number of books together. Unfortunately, Robert has been very ill for the last seven years. He's, he's um, uh, got a very bad chest infection. And I, I think also that, that Robert became very demoralized by the attacks of Egyptologists on his work. Uh, but Robert is the genius. Yeah, Robert Boval is a big archaeoastronomy dude, the Orion Giza correlation, so I like the guy quite a bit. But it's worth mentioning here that this isn't the only person that Graham has said has had health issues due to the vitriol thrown at them by the archaeological community. And, and you know, that kind of stuff, you know, if you would have asked me a year and a half ago about that, I would have been like, ah, man, I don't really know about all that. But I can tell you that as soon as I proved that one of these dudes was lying and it was in a big capacity, proved Flint Dibble was lying on the Joe Rogan debate, and I demonstrated it with receipts, like like uh, Raphael here. We, I didn't uh, I didn't just come out and say, nah, he's full of crap. I come out, he's full of crap. Here's why, here's why, here's why, here's why. Um, all of a sudden, I'm I'm in this I'm in this spot where these guys are just like they are so rotten to me. They are are I'm like public enemy number one. Like they hate me more it seems lately than they hate Graham Hancock. And it's like I, the only the, the only thing I'm guilty of is doing what they should have done on their own and fact checking somebody and saying, hey, you got this shit wrong. So. Um, I, I'm not surprised that certain people say would would feel like they have health issues due to that stuff. It, it gets really, really, really ugly. And it does take a genius sometime to make these connections because nobody noticed it before that the three pyramids of Giza are laid out on the ground in the pattern of the three stars of Orion. Oh, Orion, I see. Yeah. And skeptics will that does show an incredible. Like, of course, I'm aware of this. This is something that has been uh, going around for for decades, really, probably longer than that. And uh, it does show a very advanced knowledge of astronomy, like incredible precision. And now the precision. With that being said, it's important to be careful when we say, when we see people, I don't know if he's going to do that, but sometimes people go a little too overboard with it. It is impressive, and I do believe it's absolutely deliberate. I believe this. With that being said, when people say, oh, but no, look, it's actually correct to the infinitesimal point, then they are exaggerating, because at the end of the day, when you look at a map, the distances that, are, that we are discussing in comparison to the astronomical references that you could really not miss it. When you go down to too much of a small numeral, then it's impossible to miss it. So at the end of the day, it just becomes something said for shock factor. But it is still impressive because it denotes a highly advanced civilization that had a high level of understanding of astronomy and the laws of the cosmos up to a certain extent. Well, I'd have to agree with Metatron here that the idea that the accuracy of it being lined up with Orion's belt, like super duper accurate, is a little out there. It's not perfectly accurate. As the charts show, it's a little bit offset. But the one thing that is, and I think he's conflating these, I think that he's got them wrong in his head. I don't think he's doing it on purpose, but I think that he's got these a little bit mixed up in his head. The accuracy of the pyramid, like the Great Pyramid to itself, the squareness of itself to itself is extremely precise. That, that word does apply. When you're talking two inches at 756 foot per side, and it's like two to four inches off on at the most on any one side is like two inches and in, or four inches and one side's like this down to two inches that's within like thousands of a percent that's really 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 small that is very precise at that distance and you couldn't use like ropes because the sag would preclude you getting that kind of accuracy so there's a lot of things that are a little anomalous about it. It's not like you could just say, oh, yeah, well, they, they figured it out like this because you couldn't really do it like that. There's a lot of things about that, the Great Pyramid's accuracy that is interesting. Um, but the Orion's Belt part of it, that isn't super duper accurate like the other things are. So he is right in saying that that is more of shock factor uh, salesman point. But again, when you start talking about the squareness of the pyramid to itself or it's facing the cardinal directions, then it is ex precise does apply. 
will say, well, you can find any buildings and line them up with any stars you want. But Orion actually isn't any old constellation. Orion was the god Osiris uh, in the sky. Uh, he was, the ancient Egyptians called the Orion constellation Sahu, and they recognize it as the celestial image of the god Osiris. So yeah, I think it's deliberate. what's being copied on the ground is the belt yeah. of a deity, of a celestial deity. It's not just a random constellation. Um, and then when we take precession into account, you find something else very intriguing happening. First of all, uh, you find that the exact orientation of the pyramids as it is today and, and pretty much as it was when they're supposed to have been built 4,500 years ago, uh, it, it's not precisely related to how Orion's belt looked at that time. There's a, there's a bit of a, a twist. It's, they're, not, they're not quite right. But as you precess the stars backwards, as you hmm. go back and back and back and you come to around 10,500 BC, 12 and a half thousand years ago in the Younger Dryas, you find that suddenly they lock perfectly. They match perfectly with the three pyramids on the ground. And that's the same moment. That's something I would have to double check. And I can't blame him for wanting to double check that. I can say that that is accurate. However, there's other things involved. Um, this goes both ways, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of details real quick. Um, there's other papers, uh, one of them by uh, Vincenzo Orofino. You'll understand his name better than me, Mr. Sicilian, um, because I, I don't pronounce those names very well, Raffaello. But um, he's an Italian uh, archaeoastronomer. For some reason, Italy is a very robust place for archaeoastronomy. But at any rate, he's, he's big into it. And um, he wrote a paper, a couple of papers actually, discussing the Fourth Dynasty correlations between the uh, stars in Orion's belt and the three pyramids on the ground. Um, somebody else debated him a little bit about some other stars. I'll link both the papers below, but um, my point here is uh, that there is some other uh, discussions to be had about it. However, uh, depending on where you pick the exact point of measurement and exactly how you do the math and exactly where you think they might have lined things up, um, there are other dates involved. But there, Graham has a good point with his position too, because it also does incorporate two other features. One of them being the Milky Way, the other one being the Sphinx, as we'll discuss in a minute. And these don't necessarily line up with the, uh, with the Fourth Dynasty well, hypothesis that uh, Orofino has. But the Great Sphinx, an equinoctial monument, aligned perfectly to the rising sun on the spring equinox. Anybody can test this for themselves. Just just yeah. go to Giza on the 21st of March, be there before dawn, stand behind the Sphinx, and you will see the sun rising directly in line with the gaze of the Sphinx. Um, but the question is, what constellation was behind the Sphinx? And 12,500 years ago, it was the constellation of Leo. And actually, the constellation of Leo has a very Sphinx-like look. And I, I and my colleagues are pretty sure that the Sphinx was originally a lion entirely uh, and that it over the time. I have read about this. I didn't go deeply into it, but I have read that the original head, because the head is smaller, objectively, it does look like it's been carved on top of a pre-existing already completed monument, which had a proportionate head, whereas the Sphinx now doesn't have a proportionate head. The head of the woman is smaller. So I did hear about this and it is a very interesting idea. Well, once again, to play devil's advocate a little bit here, there is another uh, hypothesis about that, that they discuss the hardness of the three types of limestone that are involved, and the claim is that the top uh, layer would, that the the head would have collapsed if it would have been uh, the appropriate size to be um, in line with the Sphinx, and that's why it's also weathered less, is because it's a harder limestone. Now, Personally, I do find that a little bit hard to believe. Um, I, I do think that the uh, I do think the Sphinx's head has been recarved. That's my personal opinion. This is the kind of thing you can't really prove, right? Unless you find some documentation about it, you can't really prove it. But it does seem uh, as as heavily venerated as it was and stuff. It just looks so goddamn goofy right now the way it is. It, it seems to me like they would have recognized it was you know. They would have tried, wanted it to look a little nicer at some point. That's just my opinion, though. Again, I mean, apparently the Fourth Dynasty Egyptians ran with it as it is, but that to me, that is them adopting something and and you know going with it because you know it's it's the best you got of this old thing, right? So, 
again, that's speculative. That's all my own opinion. Without some serious evidence, all we can do is, is have a speculative conversation about it. Or we could be mean to each other and call each other names. It's, it's up to you. Thousands of years, it became damaged. It became eroded, particularly the part of it that, that sticks out the head. Uh, there were periods when the Sphinx was completely covered in sand, but still the head stuck out. Um, by the time you come to, to the fourth dynasty, when the great pyramids are supposedly built, by the time you come to the fourth dynasty, the head of the, the, the lion, original lion head, would have been a complete mess. And we suggest that it was then recarved into a pharaonic head. Egyptologists think it was the pharaoh Khafre, uh, but there's no real strong resemblance, but it's definitely wearing the Nemes headdress of, of a, an ancient Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, and we think that that's the result of a recarving of what was originally not only a lion bodied, but also a lion headed monument. But it wouldn't make yeah. sense. And it would make sense. Again, there's no proof one way or the other, but to me, it's the most logical position to take on it. It just seems like uh, that's the kind of thing that it looks like at some point it was recarved. It makes a lot of sense that a pharaoh would come along and try to hijack that monument by putting his own face on it. It wouldn't be the first time such a thing happened. And the proportions are pretty foobar. If you create an equinoctial marker in the time of Khafre, 4,500 years ago, and the Sphinx is an equinoctial marker. I mean, it's 270 feet long and 70 feet high, and it's looking directly at the rising sun on the equinox. If you create it then, uh, you would be better, you'd be more likely to create it in the shape of a bull, because that was the age of Taurus, when the constellation of Taurus housed the sun on the spring equinox. So why is it a lion? Now, this is actually an extremely good point, because well, this isn't a new convention. The age of Aquarius stuff, the the age that the the astronomical age being the age of whatever uh, sign the sun rises up into in the spring equinox. That is not a new convention. That is old as dirt. That goes way, 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 way back. And so we can't even trace how far back it goes for sure. But it, it does make sense that. Um, that the age of Leo would be the spring equinox. I mean, if you think about spring being the beginning of the year, right? This is when the year is renewed, okay? And then you're talking about these great cosmological cycles. It only makes sense that the spring is the date that it's the new of the year. And the beginning of the year and and we do see this in modern times we do see it in historic times and it only makes sense that we would see it in in times that we don't have written records for although admittedly it does take a bit of a stretch to accept that however it does make a lot more sense than them just switching the convention as soon as they started recording history well, it is difficult, though, to not overimpose or superimpose our own perceptions. And this is something that is real and valid uh, when it comes to the medieval period, when it comes to ancient Rome, classical antiquity, Mesoamerican civilization, East Asian civilizations, African civilizations, you name it. At the end of the day, what's logical to us doesn't automatically translate into, oh, well, then that would be logical for someone 5,000 years ago in a completely different culture, in a completely different world. It, this is why I really, really like the idea of looking at the past, not necessarily as a different moment in time, but also as a foreign slash alien country in space. Because at the end of the day, if you now, say, imagine you are from America, Germany, or the UK, I just mentioned the three higher pools of uh, viewerships for my channel to have a statistical chance of guessing right. If you're from any of these countries and you move to Japan, everything will feel alien and different to you. Well, that's how the past would feel to us, even if we don't move spatially. So if you are from Germany and then you go to Germany 3000 years ago, it would feel like a different country. The language would be different. The pronunciation would be different. The culture, the architecture, the looks, Lots of things would be different. Now, of course, there is, in a lot of countries, there is a reasonable uh, genetic and ethnic continuity. So it doesn't necessarily mean that people would look different. That really depends on the country. There are countries where that would be the case and countries where that would not be the case. But still, the hairstyles, maybe even the variety of phenotypic traits, lots of things would feel like you are in a different country altogether, if not a different planet. So I don't particularly enjoy nor like the idea of, well, to me, 
A plus B makes sense that they make C, and therefore this is what makes logical sense from the perspective of people 5,000 years ago. You don't know that, I don't know that. There are religious connotations, there are cultural connotations, linguistic connotations that we process without subconsciously that make us think, well, yeah, that makes sense, but we don't even realize that what we are saying is a byproduct of our time and cultural location. Uh, in the world. We're all children of our time. So it is very likely that since their culture, their religion, their languages, their reasoning functioned so different than ours, that something that to us makes sense to them would make absolutely no sense whatsoever. Well, to a point, Metatron, I believe that you're right. But um, to a point, I think you're also wrong. And for basically the same kind of reasons, but you got to flip it around. Like, you're a Christian, right? Um, how long can you go back in history in Italy or in Germany and find Christian iconography and find the same? You could go back to Germany, okay, speaking a different language and a different language over hundreds of years. So it's completely different tongue. But you could still do the sign of the cross. You could drop to your knees and, and do the sign of the cross when presented with somebody with the appropriate attire and be recognized and be part of the culture and, and definitely not be on another planet, right? Um, on other planets, you know, all kinds of different things could apply because of biology and evolution and whatnot. Now, I get what you're trying to say here, but um, there, the, it does become, um, it feels, it, it becomes very hyper, hyperbolic in my opinion because it, it, there is a lot of places that this, the human experience is very limited, okay? Um, an octopus sees things that we don't see, hears things that we don't hear, and feels things that we don't feel. So for us to try to communicate with an octopus about the things that we experience, see how good I am at pronouncing? Even octopus comes out wrong sometimes. Don't know what to tell you. But if, if we were going to try to communicate our experience to an octopi, uh, we would probably still get it wrong because they don't understand. They don't even see the same damn colors as us, man. So but this is my point. Anyway. I don't want to belabor it. An interesting example of that would be, for, for instance, the Chinese or Japanese character for to rest. And uh, to rest is a, a person and a tree. And possible, it's from, from our point of view, a bed would make more sense. But maybe for someone three years, uh, 3,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, somewhere in China, and they are most likely farmers, they've been working all day, they're outside and they want to rest and they use the tree to kind of lay like this and get a little rest before they need to go back. I mean, that that makes perfect sense. That's just a little thing. There is a lot like that. Well, since I kept this clip in, apparently we are belaboring the point. So look, man, as, as humans, we have a limited realm of experience. So aliens are going to be alien to us completely. They might not even use sound to communicate. They might not even use sight to navigate, all right? Um, so they might identify better with Helen Keller than they do the rest of us. So anyway, I don't want to belabor that point anymore, but that is the reality of it. That, that metaphor of, of Gus going to a foreign planet, I think, is a very poor one. It, it is it, very hyperbolic. Uh, and, and again, we think that's because of that observation of the skies and, and, and putting on the ground as above, so below, putting on the ground an image of the sky at a particular time. Now... The fact that the Giza Plateau, it's a fact, of course, that Egyptologists completely dispute, but the fact that the principal monuments of the Giza Plateau, the three great pyramids and the Great Sphinx, all lock astronomically on the date of around 10,500 BC, uh, to me is most unlikely to be an accident. And actually, if you look at computer software at the sky at that time, you'll see, you'll see that the Milky Way is very prominent and, and seems to be mirrored on the ground by the River Nile. I, I suggest that may be one of the reasons amongst many why Giza was chosen uh, as the site for this, for this very special place. Wouldn't that be completely anecdotal, though? I mean, it's not like people have... It's not like the ancient Egyptians had control of what the River Nile looked like, not to mention, is there really that much of a connection between the Nile River and the Milky Way? I, I personally don't see it, but maybe it's just me. Well, here's a chance to send Metatron down a bit of a rabbit hole here. 
when it comes to the Milky Way, um, the Nile River and the Milky Way were equated with each other in Egyptian mythology. They would frequently uh, refer to the Milky Way as the Nile or the Nile as the Milky Way, vice versa. Um, and at the time of 10,500 BC, they did meet on the horizon. So it would look like from that vantage point. And now you can say that's arbitrary, but here's the thing, man. You know, you can walk around and get things to be in a different position. You could have the river here and the Milky Way there and walk until they line up and then build your pyramids where they line up with the uh, the stars in Orion's belt and then carve a chunk of bedrock where it lines up with the uh, the sun rising and you put, uh, line it up with the carve it to look like a lion and the sphinx that's what Hancock's proposal is and it's not it wouldn't be arbitrary it would be it would actually be quite the opposite it would be extremely deliberate and very difficult to emulate you would have to pick a very specific piece of ground and then have to go to work on the things that were there so this is worth looking into man um i know you italians like archaeoastronomy so <laughs> no seriously though the, there are a lot of prominent italians in archaeoastronomy and this is um this is a pretty robust and, and interesting hypothesis i mean the the things that are posited to be emulated on the ground were all big deals to the ancient Egyptians. None of these are just like, well, you know, they kind of like this constellation. It's like, no, there's a reason these would be in a funerary site. So anyway, dig deeper as you will. I know you're like to do research and since I'm... Uh, you know, I'm no longer considered to be impartial since I picked on some archaeologists and called them out when they lied. So you, you probably are going to think that you need to double check me as well. You should. So go digging on your own, my friend. So the point I want to make is that that an astronomical um, design on the ground, which memorializes a very ancient date, does not have to have been done 12,500 years ago. If, 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 from the ancient Egyptian point of view, you're there 4,500 years ago, uh, and there's a time 8,000 years before that, which is very, very, very important to you, you could, mem you could use astronomical language and megalithic architecture to memorialize that date on the Giza Plateau, which is what we think we're looking at. I don't know, it's a little weak. Again, I'm very intrigued with the, the ideas he presents and some ideas, I think, I'm open to those possibilities. But 8,000 years ago, it's such a long time before this de decision of building that doesn't really, that it does sound very unlikely to me. In fact, I would find it very more, much more likely that by this time, when they're building the pyramids, their astronomical understandings are advanced. As you say, they create a connection. I do agree with that one, that they possibly create a connection with gods of their religion. And so they decide, hey, we are capable of doing this. Let's mimic the stars above to the ground below and let's recreate a sort of map to represent Orion because maybe Orion had a significance, a very important significance. I do believe that Orion has a central significance, not only when it comes to ancient civilizations like the Egyptians, uh, but even the Romans and even biblical stuff. And I could make a dedicated video. I will. I will. I know I always say that I will make a dedicated video to why I think Orion is central to a lot of different religions and cultures and civilizations. So I have absolutely no problem agreeing with that. But the idea that it's also somehow a way to reference symbolically the event of the Younger Dryas that occurred 8,000 years before that, why did they wait 8,000 years to do that? Maybe they didn't have the tech, I suppose, but after 8,000 years, if that's how long it took, it's a little weak. No, I can't argue with the idea that 8,000 years is a very, 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 very long time for something like that to have been carried on in a society or culture. Um, it is worth mentioning that Egypt does consist, the a ancient Egyptians timeline did consider itself to be much older than that. Um, they did trace a lineage, lineages of kings back far into prehistory. Of course, um, most timelines back in those days, most people that had histories back in those days, you'd, you'd see some stuff that we consider anomalous or just outright bullshit, right? Like the, the biblical timeline when you got guys like Methuselah lives like 969 years or whatever the fuck. Yeah, most people just dismiss that stuff as BS, but... Um, 
the funny thing here is that we do actually, Egyptologists actually use some of that same timeline as uh, part of, of their uh part of their historical record and consider it so robust they actually put it over carbon dating when the carbon dating of the of the pyramids and the uh actual written records are, are a little bit off they reconcile this by just saying oh the old wood was used and they keep the written record over the carbon dating and so it's, it's it is a little funny if you are somebody who's skeptically minded on both sides of it it's like well you guys sure value that written record really high, so high that it's over hard scientific data of carbon dating in the one hand, but on the other hand, well, clearly you just throw it out with, you know, because it's bullshit when they start talking about guys that lived for a thousand years. So it's kind of funny how, how that works out. And it is very much a uh, important thing. It's a fun fact really quick, in case you're not aware of Raffaello, is that the very first time that they tested carbon dating, they tested it in uh, Egypt when it was like being tested, tested, right? Back in the 40s, and they did that because the written records were considered to be so robust that they tested some wood that was in one of the pyramids, and they're like, aha, this is how we know that this actually works because they, they knew the date, and they used that to calibrate it. So that's how heavily valuable they consider those written records to a point. Except for one thing, and that's the erosion patterns on the Sphinx. Uh, and we're pretty sure that the Sphinx, at least, does date back to 12,500 years mm. ago. Uh, and with it, the megalithic temples, uh, the so-called Vali Temple, uh, which stands uh, just, just to the east and just to the south Valley of Temple the Sphinx. Khafre. And the Sphinx Temple, which stands directly in front of the Sphinx. The Sphinx Temple has largely been destroyed, but the Vali Temple, attributed to Khafre, on no good grounds whatsoever, um, is a huge megalithic construction with blocks of limestone that weigh up to 100 tons each. Um, and yet, it has been remodeled, refaced with granite. There are granite blocks that are placed on top of the, the core limestone blocks. And those core limestone blocks were already eroded when the granite, granite blocks were put there. Why? Because the granite blocks have actually been purposefully and deliberately cut to fit into the erosion marks on mm -hmm. the, we believe, much older fascinating blocks there. Fascinating. So, yes, so well, one side believes that the, you know, those are much older, like Graham just said. He believes that, that the core limestone blocks was much, much older, and then the... Um, the Egyptologists and whatnot believed that it was a little older, that it was, you know, a, a renovation project, but it was, you know, it was is only a few hundred years old or a thousand years old or whatever. Not, nothing crazy like that. I forget the exact numbers and I'm not uh, doing a bunch of research. Like I said, I don't did I say that at the beginning. I'm just kind of doing this uh, reaction style kind of, of, of like uh, Metatron is. I'm not, I'm not trying to dig too terribly crazy into this. I'm kind of trying to explain to him from a, you know, from a shooting from the hip perspective, why this is so interesting. I'm pretty sure I said that in the intro, but I re-recorded the intro about half a dozen times because for those of you who watched my last video, that is actually a dead pixel in my fucking camera. So I had to rig up my webcam to record from the computer. And so now I, I'm, I, yeah. So I think Giza is a very complicated site. I would never seek to divorce the dynastic ancient Egyptians from the Great Pyramids. They were closely involved in the construction of the Great Pyramids as we see them today. But what I do suggest is that there were very low platforms on the Giza Plateau that are much older and that the when we look at the three Great Pyramids we're looking at a renovation and a restoration and a enhancement of much older structures that had existed on the Giza Plateau for a much longer period before that. Now why that's a big deal is because for these to be aligned to the stars from 10,500 BC, some part of them would have had to have existed that was aligned to those stars from that long ago. So Graham's idea is there's a platform there. Now in my opinion there's a just as high of a chance, probably a higher chance in my opinion, that um, what they did was actually try to roll back the sky. Graham will talk about it in a little bit. The Egyptians had a, t a belief in a time called Zeptepi, or their first time. And once they recognized that procession of the equinoxes was a thing, um, they would realize that 
over long periods of time that the sun would change what constellation that it rose in over the course of the year. And on the spring equinox, you know, it, it would change the age of the year. So if they were trying to roll back time in order to emulate this first time, this mythical time of, of, of perfection or whatever, um, they would try to catch the same sky that they saw then. Now, whether or not they got it right is a thing, you know, the dates don't line up. So admittedly that they would assume that they got it wrong. But that makes more sense to me personally than them having a platform on the ground that was accurate enough for them to work with after 10,000, 12,000, or 8,000 years as the case would be. But anyway, that's where Graham's position is. That's why you need that platform. Actually, the Great Pyramid is built around a natural hill, uh, and that natural hill might have been seen as the original primeval mound uh, hmm. to, the, to, the, to the ancient Egyptians. So, so does he think that, the, because I'm not 100% sure, and therefore I can't provide a, a critique if I don't understand the point, is this primordial mound that he proposes has been existing way longer than the building of the, of the pyramids and, of course, Egyptian dynastic dynastic civilization was this artificial was it man-made or was it a natural hill that had significance if i don't know that then it's kind of difficult to respond to that um it was a part of the bedrock that uh, came up out of the ground um i believe that it was shaped but i don't think they know a hundred percent i think that that what they were able to discern is that there is a chunk of bedrock in the center of the pyramid that is not um that, that is natural bedrock coming straight out of the ground and into the pyramid and it's not the only pyramid that has this it's a common feature and it has to do with that primordial mound that primeval mound the uh, um, uh, egyptian mythology has like uh, one of their creation myths has uh, a primordial a, a mound of earth coming out of the waters the flood waters and that had uh, uh, adam on it and he was messing around with some lily and uh, i can't remember all the details but it, it's off the top of my head this is again I, I would google this stuff if i was making a proper response video this is gonna be long enough as it is but anyway uh, that's the whole point of it is this primordial mound was part of the rebirth and resurrection right the, the land renewing itself from the flood water so um it was part of their resurrection toolkit they believe so you see it in a lot of pyramids so it's natural the idea is that the sphinx was there long before hmm. the pyramids and the pyramids were built by the egyptian to celebrate further i mean it's possible, an already but... holy place yeah it's possible. and there were platforms in place where the pyramids stand not the pyramids as we see them today um but the 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 bases, the base of those pyramids uh, was, was already in place. At that point. All right, now pay attention there because Graham said it twice that the base of those pyramids is what existed when the dynastic Egyptians came along and built on them. So when Raffaello gets this wrong in a minute and, and doesn't seem to remember that it was said it twice, um, I get to wag my finger. <laughs> so what's the case, what's the evidence that the Egyptologists use to make the attributions that they do for the dating of the pyramids and the Sphinx? Well, um, the three great pyramids of Giza are different from later pyramids. This, this is another problem that I have with <laughs> the whole thing, um, is the, the, the story of pyramid building. When did, it, when did it really begin? And the timeline that we get from Egyptology is the, the first pyramid is the pyramid of the pharaoh Zoser, uh, the step pyramid at Saqqara, mm -hmm. um, about a hundred years or so before the Giza pyramids are built. Uh, and then we have this explosion in the fourth dynasty uh, of, of true pyramids. Uh, we have three of them attributed to a single pharaoh, Sneferu, who built supposedly the pyramid at Maidum and the two pyramids at Dashur, the Bent and the Red Pyramid. Uh, and then within that same hundred year span, uh, we have the Giza pyramids being built. This is according to the Orthodox chronology. Yeah. And then suddenly, once the Giza project is finished, pyramid building goes into a massive slump in ancient Egypt. Uh, and the pyramids of the fifth dynasty are frankly speaking a mess outside. They're, they're very inferior constructions. You can hardly recognize them as pyramids at all. But what happens when you go inside them is you find that they're extensively covered 
in hieroglyphs uh, and imagery repeating the name of the king who was supposedly buried in that place whereas the Giza pyramids have no internal inscriptions whatsoever uh, what they do what we do have sure yeah I mean that it's it's a good point that is presenting to challenge the ideas that we have when it comes to Egyptology and chronology of pyramid building and construction it is absolutely legit legitimate for him to say that also let's keep in mind that there could be if we want to use Occam razor a much easier explanation which could be a different a difference in power shift in political priorities so reallocation of funds and last but not least cultural changes all of these happen within a hundred years it does happen and therefore it could be as simple as that they don't want to justify the same amount of monument funds allocated to monumental construction as they did before. And when it comes to the changes of decoration inside, lack of hieroglyphs against presence or dense, intense presence of hieroglyphs could also be a cultural shift. I mean, look at how different pre-communist China is after communist China, or like even or even the difference in a hundred years between the Ming dynasty and then the Mongolian dynasty before that. Like, there, there is a lot of change that can happen in a hundred years when it comes to customs and values. Well, this is true. It absolutely could be a cultural shift that di dictates all this stuff. But that's um, that only has to do with the hieroglyphs. The uh, building project being as fast as it is, like, like Graham says, this is just over the course of, of a little over 100 years, they're supposed to have just cranked out like half a dozen of the most impressive buildings the ancient world ever saw. It's, it's a little ridiculous. And it's also ridiculous to, to assume that all of these guys, it would be four rulers, right, over the course, one guy building three pyramids and another three building one each, it's a little ridiculous to assume that all of these guys, none of them would be uh, egoman egomaniac enough to like start slapping their name all over the fucking things. Um, it's, it's a little bit crazy even when you think about it that the first guy needed three tombs. I mean, if pyramids were tombs and nothing but tombs or, or tombs, inherently tombs and then like a, a power symbol on top of that, which is like a very common mainstream histor historian pers perspective, right? Um, that, that is still, it doesn't explain why he needed three. What, you, you just build three tombs, so you can't, now maybe so you couldn't figure out where he was buried, but even still it would be like, well, just like build a big ass tomb and then go stash his body in the grit in a desert, right? That's, that's how you would hide the damn thing. So, um, there, there is some anomalous things about it. And, and Graham is also right to point out that they, or get very, very, very good at it, and then it falls apart very quickly. Now, it is possible that it was a cultural shift and that they replaced the like magnificent building with magnificent artwork on the inside because it was the best they could do or something like that, but that's still... You're... <laughs> you're kind of hard-pressed to explain why they would build pyramids at that point to begin with. It's, the, when the culture shifts like that, it, anyway, you have a lot to, a lot of speculation going on there, but when a culture is kind of gutted like that, it's like, it, it, just to draw a weird metaphor, if they got rid of guitars entirely right now, where would rock and roll actually be? You know, I mean, you, you would have pop and hip-hop, but where would rock and roll like old school blues four chord or three chord freaking one four five rock and roll what would happen to that it, it, it would disappear right so um that's kind of how i look at it with this stuff it's like they really what was impressive about the pyramids was all gone the permanency the massiveness of the the, the like the the man-made mountain that was gone so why continue to make them um Anyway, that's we get into speculation here, right? And that's where this actually does get to be a lot of fun, as long as the people you're talking to have an open mind and aren't complete assholes about it. So that could also be an knock and razor explanation. So I'm not necessarily saying that he's wrong. I'm not a hater. I'm just someone who likes to discuss, but I'm just presenting sort of playing the devil's advocate a little bit. Which is one of the reasons that I'm taking so much time responding to this. This is a nice response video for me, man. I'm sitting down instead of standing up. I'm not the least bit frustrated by this. I know we're going to disagree on points, and that's just fine because 
Well, you're just playing devil's advocate a little bit. I do that too. As long as we're just being chill, man, this kind of stuff all day long is only betters knowledge, humanity, whatever. At least the people that see us on YouTube, right? Have is one piece of graffiti about which there is some controversy. Uh, basic statistics, it, it's a six million ton structure. Um, it's, each side is about 750 feet long. Yeah. Um, it's aligned almost perfectly to true north, south, east and west uh, within three sixtieths of a single degree. The sixtieths because degrees are divided into sixties. Um, and and um, uh, it's the precision of the orientation and the absolute massive size of the thing, uh, plus it's very complicated internal passageways uh, that, 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 that are involved in it. Well, you see where Graham goes with that? The size and then the precision. Those two things put together are what really is wild about the Great Pyramid. The, the internal passageways and stuff is pretty cool too. It, it is very very enigmatic but when you really get out the tape measure and start measuring the thing really closely and look at how big the damn thing is like i said earlier the precision is insane it, it really is precise you know in the ninth century the great pyramid still had its facing tone stones in place yeah true but there were there was an arab uh, an arab caliph caliph al mamun who had already realized that other pyramids did have their entrances in the north face. Nobody knew where the entrance to the Great Pyramid was. Mm. But he figured, there's an entrance to this thing. It's going to be in the north face somewhere. So he put together a team of workers, and they went in with sledgehammers, and they started smashing where he thought would be the entrance. And they cut their way into the Great Pyramid uh, for a distance of maybe 100 feet. And then the hammering that they did dislodged something they heard a little bit further away something big falling and they realized there was a cavity there and they started heading in that direction and then they joined the internal passageway of the of, of the great pyramid the descending and the ascending corridors that go up when you go up the ascending corridor every one of the internal passageways in the in the great pyramid that people can walk in slopes at an angle of 26 degrees that's interesting because the angle of slope of the exterior of the great pyramid is 52 degrees so we know mathematicians were at work as well as geometers yeah. well of the, course in, in the creation of the great they would be absolutely even roman engineers were well versed in mathematics you have to be to be able to build with precision. Oh yeah, you're gonna definitely have to have mathematicians and engineers of the cutting edge of whatever time you're talking about in order to build things like this. But the thing that he really gets into there that was interesting to me is when he talks about the way that these tomb raiders had to fucking tunnel their way into this. It's like they're digging through and they hear something and they change their direction and stuff. Uh, this was very happenstance, a little bit by clue, but, you know, a little educated guest telling him to go in the northern face and s somewhat in the right area, but they ended up lucking into it. it and this is, um, you know, I, as from what I understand, the plugs that block that entrance are still there today. It's like the the Great Pyramid is a weird little thing. They They didn't go in the way that you were intended to go in. It was easier for them to go around and that's that's weird in and of itself now isn't it um if you go up the grand gallery which is at the end of uh, the uh, so-called ascending corridor and it's mm. above the so-called queen's chamber you go up the grand gallery you're eventually going to come to what is known as the king's chamber in which there is a sarcophagus and that sarcophagus is a little bit too big to have been got in through the narrow entrance passageway. It's almost as though the so-called king's chamber was built around the sarcophagus uh, already in place. And that's the kind of quote-unquote minor detail that is actually a huge fucking thing, man. They built the entire thing around a fucking granite box? Are you kidding me? They, they put the granite box down. And then they squared the whole thing to build a... Uh, dude, this starts to get a little bit on the weird side. So you obviously have to have another explanation, but this is a big, heavy piece of granite. So this, this does get to be, at the very least, it's very troublesome, the way that this was built. And the 20-year timeline is absolutely absurd. 
Above the king's chamber are five other chambers. These are known as relieving chambers. Uh, the theory was that they were built to relieve the pressure on the king's chamber of the weight of the monument. But I think what makes that theory dubious is the fact that even lower down, where more weight was involved, you have the queen's chamber and there are no such relieving chambers above that. To me, one of the things that's the hardest to accept about the relieving chambers being relieving chambers um, if we were to accept the mainstream timeline, is how fast they would have had to have figured this out. You know, they just make a handful of pyramids, like three pyramids, and they realize, oh man, if we don't put this hollow space here with these beams to crossways in between, the whole thing is going to collapse. It doesn't, these are counterintuitive ideas that take engineers a lot of time to figure out, and the um, you know, they're supposed to have just, you know, the mainstream time, the mainstream historians, from what I understand, last I read, they think that shit like the Bent Pyramid was an accident. Fucking Dave Miano said that the uh, four, the, the fact that the pyramid has eight sides instead of four, which, by the way, if you weren't aware, um, if you look closely, the pyramid actually has eight sides instead of four. Um, he said that that was an accident. You know, this is a mistake. It's like, dude, if this is the case, how the fuck... Are these guys supposed to be so good at it that they know to do things like this relieving chamber? That's some nuanced shit right there. So I have a hard time believing that um, I have a hard time believing the mainstream theory on it to begin with. But the the, the relieving chambers it doesn't look like a relieving chamber to me. It does look like personally I think it had some sort of symbolic function. I'm not a believer in ancient high technology. I think it was more like ascend the, the spirit to the apex to shoot him off to one of the stars in Orion's belt which would line up with their mythology and stuff going up to the Duat. And, uh, anyway um, that makes more sense to me than it being um, either a relieving chamber or a piece of technology. that This had like a bit of spiritual significance. But again without some writings we're we're kind of you know we can just talk to each other as long as we don't get mean in the top of these five chambers a british adventurer and vandal called howard vise who who dynamited his way into those chambers mm -hmm. in the first place allegedly found well he claims he found the graffiti uh, a piece of graffiti left by a work gang naming the pharaoh khufu and it's true i've been in that chamber and there is the cartouche of khufu there uh, quite quite recognizable but the dispute around it is whether that is a genuine piece of graffiti dating from the old kingdom uh, or whether howard vise uh, actually put it there himself uh, because he was in desperate need of money at the time mm. um I'm not sure. Now, Howard Weiss's expedition to Egypt is actually one of my favorite things to talk about when I'm discussing, like, the double think or the horseshoe theory shit that goes on in this community because, well, all right, we just saw Graham, and he's, he's questioning the, you know, the, the uh, validity of the cartouche that says that the pyramid belonged to Khufu because... There is the argument that, you know, Vice's team was needing some money and so they're, you know, they're running out of money and they're like, hey man, we did find something. We can prove that this pyramid would belong to Kupu. So that is a legitimate arguing point at the same time. What's funny about that to me is Howard Vice's team did discover something else. Something that alternate historians, well, they almost never question its validity because, well, the Great Pyramid's a Bronze Age structure, right? But Howard Weiss's team found an iron plate that was supposedly wedged between two of the blocks. The guys did use dynamite, so the the report is they blasted a chunk of freaking of pyramid open, and between two of the blocks, they pulled out a piece of iron plate. Now, the iron plate is not meteoric iron, um, but it is very, very, very low-grade smelted iron. Very low-grade, like uber-primitive. Now... Um, I've got a video on it. There's a link right over here, so you can um, look at it that if you're interested. But basically, um, my point here is, if you're the guys that are into alternate history that believe in ancient high technology, they love that iron plate. They believe that that was a legitimate find, but they don't believe that the Khufu's cartouche is a legitimate find necessarily. That one, eh, I don't know, man. Maybe not. Same team though. And if you look at the archaeologists, the mainstream historians, the debunkers, 
They're like, I don't know about that iron plate, man. Maybe Vice's team was just like trying to like, you know, make it a little bit more, uh, more cool of a find than they actually had. Same argument. But when it comes to that cartouche, well, why would you question? Why would they fake it? So it is kind of funny to me because we do see Horseshoe Theory uh, very plainly laid bare when you look at Howard Vice's expedition to the Great Pyramid. Another reason why, but it's one of the reasons that... that Can you imagine, like, if you were... Not, not that I like the idea that they drilled inside the pyramid, but, I mean, can you imagine if you were part of that first team that found the entrance to the pyramids and now you're walking through corridors that haven't been walked for who knows how long? I mean, if, 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 um, Egyptologist correct, maybe three, four thousand years 4,000 years old, but if he's right, 10,000 years old, regardless, thousands of years old. Imagine if you go down those corridors and you know that no man has in such a long time and you have no idea what you're going to find in there. Imagine if you're a superstitious man. Goodness gracious, that would be, what an adventure. It's like literally Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider. Well, now, I know that a lot of you think that Tomb Raider was a PlayStation 1 game, but it was not. That was a Sega Saturn game. Like this game here, and like this game here. Yes, that was the obligatory, hey, check it out, Metatron. I got retro games too, part of the video. You don't like it? Well, too late. You done watched it. That uh, Egyptologists feel confident in saying that the pyramid is the work of Khufu. Um, another is what is called the Wadi al Jaf papyri, uh, where uh, on the Red Sea, uh, a, a diary, the diary of an individual called Merer, was found, and he talks about bringing um, highly polished limestone uh, to the Great Pyramid. And it's clear that what he's talking about is the facing stones of the Great Pyramid. He's right, not talking about the body of the Great Pyramid. He's talking about the facing stones of the Great Pyramid during the reign of. Khufu. So that's another reason why the, the, the Great Pyramid is attributed to Khufu. Yeah, there's a lot of little things like that, that that add up to show. There's no question that there was a lot of work done on the Giza Plateau, on those three pyramids and a bunch of the outlying uh, uh, buildings around them during the Fourth Dynasty. That's, that's unquestionable. Um, Graham's position is a little bit more nuanced. It's like saying... Um, you know, there's no the, pick a pick a, a big building in your area that's like if if you live in a historic area, you probably got a building that's been renovated that is a historic building, and so it's 150 years old, but it's got a shitload of work done in the last five years, right? And that's the kind of thing that Graham's positing has happened here, that you know that, that there's a lot of uh, stuff done on the pyramid thousands and thousands of years ago and uh, tens of thousands of years ago in Graham's opinion like 12,000 years ago or so and then it was renovated afterwards so um, I, one would get the impression that Graham belie might believe that the pyramid was originally built as something entirely different maybe even 12,000 years ago was leveled during the ice age or around that time or during the younger Dryas or whatever and then renovated after the fact um and that's you know that that is a little bit um that's a bit of a stretch right there's no question about it but it is a fun hypothesis it's definitely definitely one that's um worth entertaining because of the data that comes with it as i've spoken about before with ben from uncharted x and his talking about the uh the the precision vases just because somebody says something that you might think is outlandish, give them a fair shake. Because unless the person is dumb as a box of rocks, which neither Ben nor Graham is, there's a reason that they have that belief. And if you listen to them, even if you don't come away with the same conclusion they do, the evidence they bring to bear is quite often intriguing as fuck. And I don't know about you, but just like that walking through the first corridor that nobody'd been through for thousands of years, I'm way more interested in the mysterious shit than I am trouncing my feet over the stuff that everybody else has been over. I don't want to be a tourist. I want to be a Tomb Raider. Um, but I think I think that we're, we're, Khufu was undoubtedly involved in the Great Pyramid and in a big way, but I think he was building upon and elaborating a much older structure. And I think the heart of that structure is the subterranean chamber, which mm. is a 100 feet vertically beneath the base of the Great Pyramid. 
anybody who suffers from claustrophobia will not enjoy being down there. You got to go down a 26 degree sloping corridor uh, until a, a distance of about 300 feet. It's 100 feet vertically, but the slope means you're going to walk at a distance of about, not walk, you're going to ape walk. You're, going to, you're hmm. almost going to have to crawl. I've learned from long experience that the best way to go down these corridors is actually backwards. Uh, hmm. If you go forward, you keep bumping your head on them because they're only three feet, five inches high. Uh, you get down to the bottom, you have a short horizontal passage. Not a and chance. And then you get into the subterranean chamber. Um, the theory of Egyptology is that this was supposed to be the burial place of Khufu. But after cutting out that 300 foot long, 26 degree sloping um, passage, a lot of which passes through bedrock, and having cut the subterranean chamber out of bedrock, gone to all that trouble, they decided they wouldn't bury him there. And they built what's now known as the Queen's Chamber as his burial chamber. But then they decided that wouldn't hmm. do either. So they then built the King's Chamber. And that's where the Pharaoh is supposed to have been buried. Those Arab raiders under Caliph Mamun didn't find anything in the Great Pyramid at all. So your idea is that... Uh... Well, it could be that... Hmm. That's a very good point. Now, as somebody who talks about psychology a lot in their stuff, I, I, I definitely honed in right there when he was like, well, you see, it could be that, uh, hmm, okay. Metatron believes that these were tombs, and, and that's fine. You know, he's, he's a mainstream historian, and he's going to believe that these were tombs slash projections of power. But when he's faced with the evidence that there is no bodies ever found in a pyramid, he does have to concede that that's interesting, even though he was like, well, wait, hang on. I, hmm. Am I going to go all apologist with this, or am I just going to be actually uh, honest and say what is the fact of the matter? That's a good point. You, that that shit. Okay, there was nobody. So no, I'll take that uh, that truck a little. I'll take that a step further. Um, they have found one sealed sarcophagus in one of the pyramids, and it didn't have a body in it either. So that's kind of a big deal. It kind of shows that sarcophaguses were sealed sometimes without bodies in them which is you know that that's worth mentioning it's noteworthy but this is what i want to say about metatron this is why i wanted to respond to this video and why i'm taking so much time like i said it's just just nice he is uh um, he's honest man that that's that is the mark of integrity right there that's the mark of actually evaluating the evidence and if everybody in this community at least tried to do that well, nobody's perfect even i'm gonna make mistakes even me make mistakes sometimes i know it's unbelievable right but i have made mistakes more than one <laughs> but it, it, if we all sit down and like have legitimately honest conversations with each other man we could really get a long way really fast just compare it as a metaphor imagine if all the nations on the earth started working together to try to get us on the mars how fast we could do that same kind of thing here if we were trying to crack the pyramid if we would all like stop pissing and moaning with each other and fighting with each other and like bring all the expertise of all the people interested in Mr. Bear, I bet in 10 years we would have all kinds of answers that we ain't even gotten the radar right now because we're too busy arguing with each other. Which, yes, I know I'm one of the people that argues with each other, so don't think I'm not pointing a finger at myself. I'm just saying that's one of the problems. Jeez. I can't even talk to my own freaking audience without the audience in my mind yelling at me. The Sphinx and maybe some aspects of the pyramid were much earlier. Yes. And why that's important is it, in that case, it would be evidence of some transfer of technology. Yes. From a much older civilization. Yeah. The idea is that during the Younger Dryas, most of that civilization was uh, either destroyed or damaged and they desperately scattered across the the globe. Seeking refuge. Seeking refuge and telling stories of um, maybe one, the importance of the stars, mm -hmm. their knowledge about the stars yeah. and their knowledge about building and knowledge about navigation. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 that's roughly the idea. No, I think this is really important to get right here is that Lex got this right away. It took him no time at all for him to be like, okay, so basically you're talking about survivors that had like 
some advanced astronomy, some advanced shipbuilding, some advanced navigation, but like at the end of the day they're they're not like like building lasers or flying UFOs or or smelting metal. And Graham's like, yeah, that's basically the gist of it. Which is hilarious because you can find guys like Flint Dibble screaming that that's not the case at all. Graham, everybody knows that when you talk about ancient high technology, you mean blah, and he just because he needs a straw man to attack. And it's like, again, we could have these conversations like um, like I'm having, hope, hopefully, with Metatron here. Or you can have the kind of conversations that we don't have with the mainstream dudes where we're talking past each other. And it's all based on vitriol. You know, I'm sorry, Flint, if you're watching this one. You can only call somebody not a racist but so many times before they're fucking done with you. That's just how that works. Uh, so it's interesting that the ancient Egyptians uh, have an, a notion of an epoch that they call Zeptepi, which is the first time. It means the first time. This is when the gods walked the earth. Uh, this is when uh, seven sages brought wisdom to ancient Egypt. Very interesting to these seven sages because we also have the seven weapons uh, the, the gods of destructions that are mentioned in the uh, Sumero Akkadian religious texts. So there is a recurrence of number seven in there, which I find fascinating. Oh, hell, man. You need to check out freaking all kinds of stuff in this community then. Like, there was uh, seven wise men that were said to have been the original explorers of uh, Easter Island, Rapa Nui, right? Um the, the number seven pops up a lot. Not only that, but the number 72, which is related to the procession of the equinoxes, which takes 71.6 years to complete one degree. The, the number 72, which is not rounded up, frequently pops up in these kinds of things and is frequently... Uh, you should check out Hamlet's Mill. Um, it's a slog of a read. Um, I would uh, honestly compare it to wading through a sewer looking through di for diamonds, but you will find diamonds, I guarantee it. But, fuck, this is a slog of a read. But, um, by and large, basically, there it does seem to be that there, there may well have been a group of people or a, a lost civilization that was communicating astronomical knowledge about procession of the equinoxes through mythology for a very, very, very long time on this planet, all across the places. You'll find it in Cambodia. Angkor Wat shows signs of this, okay? So, again, deep rabbit hole. You may have heard of some of this before, but um, I can assure you that, there, that some of this does bear out mathematically. Whether or not it was intentional, well, you can argue about that till we're both blue in the face, but... Um, the, a lot of this shit is there, and it's unquestionably there. The best you can do is say that it's anomalous if you're trying to debunk it. So anyway, more rabbit hole for you there, Metatron. I hope you dive into some of this stuff. Uh, and that is seen as the origin of ancient Egyptian civilization. There are king lists in by the ancient Egyptians themselves. There are king lists that go go back way beyond the first dynasty, go back 30,000 years into the past in ancient Egypt considered to be entirely mythical by Egyptologists, but nevertheless, it's interesting that there's that, that reference to, to remote time. Yeah, you might remember me mentioning that at the beginning of the video. And there's a reason, as Graham says, it's interesting. There's this reference to remote time in the same Keynes list that is considered to be kind of the gold standard, so much so that they used it to date carbon dating, to calibrate carbon dating when they first tested it. So it is an interesting little anomaly. Now, what you also have in Egypt are what might almost be described as secret societies. Okay, so I'm interested, rather than the secret societies, I'm interested in this, how the Great Pyramid was built. Let's see what this theory is. If you look into the, into the future, maybe the next hundred years, what, what do you hope are the interesting discoveries in archaeology that will that we'll find. Well, I'd really like to know how the Great Pyramid was built. Hmm, uh, I see. And, and we now have, with new tech, with, with scanning technology, it's now become apparent that there are many major voids within the Great Pyramid. Uh, uh, right above the Grand Gallery, there's a, what looks like a second Grand Gallery that has been I identified with remote scanning. Now, this void has been the subject of a lot of speculation amongst pyramidians and uh, even irregular mainstream Egyptologists. I mean, if you were going to hide the body, and that would be a pretty good spot to hide the body, right? Would be 
the place that they still haven't found thousands of years later, even when they think they found the rest of the spot. So there's a good chance that there's, you know, there's a lot of speculation. That's what I'm trying to say here. But what's interesting about this is the lack of actual digging that's been done. The lack of, it's like eight years since then. Jimmy Corsetti loves to beat this drum, and I can get why. It's like, why the fuck haven't we looked, man? What? How many tourist dollars do you need before you go there? And honestly, I I'm, I I would not be surprised if part of the reason is is that they're just afraid. They're afraid they will find a body there, and they'll be like, "Ah, oh, fuck!" Once we prove that this thing is for certain a tomb and nothing but, all the New Age money, all the fucking pyramidiot dollars, all the Atlantis money dries up. Now, I don't think that the, that money would dry up, but. Um, and Joe was quick to call me out on that when I was on Joe Rogan. He's like, whoa, 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 man, that ain't how that would work. And I agree. But I also think that the guys tasked with being in charge of tourism would probably be afraid of that. Uh, and and um, new chambers, one of them has even been opened up uh, already, are being found as a result of this. So so it may be that the, se that the Great Pyramid will ultimately give up its secrets. I often think that the Great Pyramid is, is partly designed to do that. It's designed to invite its own initiates. Some people aren't interested in the Great Pyramid at all, uh, but some people are fascinated by it and they're drawn towards it. And when they're drawn towards it, it immediately starts raising questions in their minds and they seek answers to their questions. So it's like saying... Yeah, it feels a bit like pattern recognition that we do have as humans. We have the tendency to see patterns even when there is none. To me, the idea of, oh, the pyramid is there because it wants to teach you stuff, but you've got to look for it. Where, where, I mean, sounds nice, but... Well, my hypothesis about the pyramids, one of my hypotheses about the pyramids is that these were basically memory machines. Like, you know, the idea that your immortality is contingent on how well people remember you. So all these different kings would try to slap their name on it this way or another by, you know, um, being part of the thing. Like one of the early pyramids, one of the earliest pyramid, had a bunch of vessels found in it with the names of earlier rulers. Uh, and I think this was part of the same thing. You're uh, inviting future generations to remember you through the puzzle, through the mystery, through the deliberate uh, d play, the, 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 the mind fuckery, um, and you're trying to elicit an actual, like, uh, trying to keep your soul alive. We still say Khufu's name a lot today. I dare say that Khufu's name is mentioned more on a daily basis in the Western world than Alexander the Great. All right? And that's strictly because of the pyramid. And I believe that that's the intention. I believe that, I, that that's one of my hypotheses. I can't say I believe that. But I, w I, I think that that's a very good chance that that was the reason that this was built, was just to get people to remember the people that were involved. And I think that that's why things like the Sphinx would get hijacked, because, well, you know, I mean, same kind of deal here. I think that that was part of Egyptian uh, belief, is that they that you needed to be remembered. And I think that we... That, that explains, if you look at a lot of their big buildings through that lens, it explains a lot, in my opinion. Here I stand. Investigate me. Yeah, Find no. out about I mean, me. I, Figure I out know. where I am. Why have I got these two shafts cut into the side of the so-called Queen's Chamber? Uh, why didn't they just tell us then? That's the part that I don't understand to this approach, which I know some people. Why making it so you have to investigate it in order to get... I mean, maybe you'll have an idea for this. I just find it difficult. It's either you want to keep it secret to me and you don't want people to understand. You don't care. And all of this is just a, the fact that you can discover some things and not discover some things is coincidental. And at the end of the day, they didn't care. Or they want you to know. But if they do want you to know, then why hiding it? Like, imagine if we are about to experience a cataclysmic event and we're like, oh, we want generations in like 2,000 years from now after the ruins of our civilizations. We want them to be able to still build computers. Do you think we would try to preserve a full manual that tries to explain people how to build a computer for their own sake? Or do you think we would make it into a puzzle that only if you really, really, really want to know, you'll be able to figure it out? But otherwise, yeah, no, sorry, because you have to first decode this and then we put a reference, but you can only understand it if you can see the solar eclipse. I mean, 
Yeah. Well, that would very much depend on what your intention was with that puzzle. Is it for hiding knowledge or is it for spreading knowledge? Now, if it's for hiding knowledge, you know, and this is ignoring my last hypothesis. This is just for the idea of the pyramid encoding knowledge. Okay. Um, if the idea is to hide knowledge and only dispense it to initiates while having the, the dispensary of knowledge in plain sight, but if you don't have the key, you can't get it. Well, in that case, that would make a ton of sense. Now, if the in intention is to just like get knowledge out to any old Tom, Dick, and Harry that tend to look, well, yeah, the more you hide it, the more hard that is to fucking make sense with. It would be covered in hieroglyphs then, right? Telling you, hey, by the way, you need to do X, Y, and Z. So um, that's how I would look at something like that, I suppose. It's a little bit different than uh, Raffaello looks at it, but, you know, what do you do? Why do they slope up through the body of the Great Pyramid? Why do they not exit on the outside of the Great Pyramid? Why? But then again, you know, to quote myself, maybe that's something that people in the past did? Because at the end of the day, perhaps I'm applying my own logic. It's just that it doesn't make sense to me that they want to reveal, but they have to do it as a puzzle. Now, that sounds like something that sells well to the audience. No, I can't get that position. But uh, again, it does kind of ignore like a lot of the whole... I mean, your name is Metatron, right? That's it's like the whole hermetic, you know, sacred geometry, secret societies. We 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 don't just spit all the knowledge out in the world. We we tend to hide some of it. So that that is kind of the idea um, behind a lot of that stuff. So it, it, I don't know. That that kind of is a weak point to me. Why, when we send a robot up those shafts, do we find them after about 160 feet blocked by a door with metal handles? Why, when we drill through that door to see what's beyond it, three or four feet away, we see another door? Uh, it's like very frustrating, but it's, it's saying to us, keep on exploring. If you, if you're pers and Mr. Hancock, I, I don't know. I think you're looking, you're seeing too much into this. If they have multiple doors, it's because they want to make it harder to get to whatever thing there is inside there. It's not because they're like, oh, I'm putting a door because I want you to not give up. I mean, keep exploring. <laughs> it's sorry, but no. All right, now this is purely because clearly Metatron doesn't know, but these are fucking tiny passages, dude. They're like, they set up a little robot, the first one back in the 90s, like a remote control car kind of thing that was built to do it. Um, the, the, these doors are, if you were looking at it from the ancient Egyptians' perspective, you would have to have, like, uh, you, you ever watch the movie Beastmaster and he's got those two little fucking, uh, those ferrets that run around? Now, if they carried around, like, a shitload of steroids and they got to that door and they popped those steroids, then they could pull that block out and then jam it through the top of the pyramid and then my point is dude that this doesn't make any sense you've got a robot that has to get there making a second door is that much harder to get through no man this was it's weird okay it's fucking weird there's there's no question that it's you're you're not sending you're not sending a human in that in that tunnel it's not happening it has to be a robot or a trained monkey or some shit so anyway um, this is, you know, this is where Metatron clearly just doesn't know. He hasn't done the research, and that's great. It's honestly awesome, and that's why I'm glad to see him here making this kind of thing. I'm happy to be able to draw him into the conversation a little bit, hopefully with some of these mysteries, because, man, I don't expect, I don't believe in ancient high technology. I do believe in, like, a lost civilization from back then that has that advanced mathematics, and better astronomy, yada, yada, like we talked about a minute ago, but I don't think that they were, like, you know, as Jimmy Corsetti would say, space lasers and shit. I don't think it was really high tech, but I think um, there's anomalies that are worth discussing. And if we knee jerk and just say, well, no, you know, every time I hear that, it's always associated with space lasers. Well, then you know what, man? What good is the discussion? What good is the scientific method if we just like use our guts to discern which things are worth looking into or not? It's fucking why even use it? I don't enough, see it. We'll eventually give you the answer. So I'm no, hoping I don't that that it. answer will come I as to how it. this most mysterious of monuments was actually built and the inspiration that lay behind it. Certainly, I'm sure it was never a tomb or a tomb only. Uh, 
the later pyramids might have been. Actually, no pharaonic burial has been discovered in any pyramid, but, but uh, nevertheless, it's pretty clear that the later pyramids, with the pyramid texts written on the walls, like the Pyramid of Unas, 5th Dynasty Pyramid at Saqqara, uh, were, were tombs. Um, but but uh, the Great Pyramid, to go to that length to create a tomb, to make it a scale model of the Earth, uh, to orient it perfectly to true north, to make it 6 million tons, this is not a tomb. Uh, this is something else. This is a curiosity device. This is something that is asking us to understand it. And I hope we will understand it. And I hope, I hope Egyptologists will. Well, I think the idea that it's Galamia. Well, the idea that a pyramid is not just a tomb, I agree with that. A pyramid is also a symbol of power. It is made majestic and enormous also as a way to psychologically control the masses. At the end of the day, and I say this as a religious man, but at the end of the day, the reason why our cathedrals within Christianity are so massive are to make you feel small, as the single individual person is supposed to not feel at the same height as the people that have the authority of people in power. At the end of the day, I agree with him, the pyramid is not just a tomb, it is a symbol of power, it is a tool for mass control, but but I don't know if he means something else. Like, I don't, I don't know if he means that if he's one of those people that believe that maybe was some kind of um, spaceport or if it's some kind of map for space travel pointers, or if it's a power plant, all of that, I find it fascinating. And I could watch documentaries and stuff talking about this uh, for hours in a row, because I love it the same way I love science fiction. But it does remain science fiction, unless documented evidence actually changes it and transports it into the realm of science, which, if it does, then I'll always be open-minded. If they can prove it, I'll be like, okay, great. It was a power plant and it was used to dock spaceships from a civilization that came from Orion. I can't disprove it, so I'm not going to say it's absolutely impossible that that's what happened. Maybe it is what happened. But of course, at this point, the simple idea that there is a couple of sets of doors, from that, I don't think it's enough to prove it. But it is nice to talk about it, which is why I do appreciate this interview and I appreciate every single one of you watching here. Thank you for joining. Thank you for watching uh, the Metatron's channel and I will see you tomorrow for my next daily upload. Thank you very much for watching and remember the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. And see, this is why I like Metatron. I mean, this was, this was you know, even though I disagree with a lot of what he, he says here at the end, in particular regards to evidence, he's polite and he does find a reason to do this sort of thing. The passionate amateur has value even when they're going down the wrong path in his mind because they still gather data. And I couldn't agree with him more. Now, I would also point out here that there is some evidence here. This, this is the kind of thing where you do have to look into it a lot. I mean, um, there's a lot of stuff that you didn't know to begin with, and no offense, Metatron, but that's just, you know, you didn't know it, and that, you didn't know it. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, some of the stuff that is worth pointing out, though, is that, like, you know, there's maps of Antarctica with ice-free coasts from a long time ago, and uh, that um, people can say that, you know, well, these maps, you know, there's other explanations than they were made by people that mapped Antarctica when it was ice-free, or the coasts were ice-free, excuse me, not the whole continent. But um, the cartographers that have examined these maps, they're of the opinion that these things are legit. And now you can say, well, that's, you know, those are cartographers, but that's not, you know, that's not what the historians, that's not what the antiquitarians say. But these guys are all have like a vested interest in a narrative. It's like, this is the what we believe. A cartographer just looks at it and says, fucking this is what it is, man. This guy mapped this and this is what it looks like. So it's difficult for me to like put my stock in the people that are more concerned with the vested interest than the people that are more just looking at the map. So there's situations like that where there is evidence that it's like, it, it gets a little bit where it's like, the iron plate and the great pyramid now that doesn't prove i've got a video about that like i said and it doesn't it's, it's not about atlantis providing it but it, it doesn't prove a lost advanced civilization way out there but you're talking iron age artifacts showing up in bronze age egypt and that's not like it's really 
if you look at my video, you'll see that that's really not really something you can argue against. It, most likely that was the situation. And that's, you know, th that's crazy, man. But you're not going to find that stuff if you just ignore the metal plate and say, well, there's nothing to see here. It's bullshit. It was just a hoax. Or this metal plate is proof that they have these they had ancient high technology in fucking space lasers. So in between that, there is the sweet spot where there is new information to be garnered by honest inquiry and sad to say that i can't find many archaeologists that are willing to play that game happy to say metatron seems to be completely willing to play that game and i'm happy to make a response video to somebody who i don't have to call all kinds of horrible names or imply is lying or Otherwise, make apologism for something like that. There, you know, I've done all kinds of things trying to shore up or knock down the people that I've talked about in the past. And in this case, it's just like, I disagree with this dude and he's fucking all right in my book. Well, thank you very much for watching. Thanks again, Tim, for the cool ass shirt. Uh, sorry that I can't make merch of it, but I don't want to get sued by the Pokemon company. Um, I've got links below to all of the uh, the stuff to support the channel and other places to check me out at. And I am got merch on the way. Um, Christmas is kind of boning things up because I'm doing local people as much as possible, right down to the graphic artist if I can help it. So anyway, stuff is coming. Thank you very much again for watching this far. Love y'all. Have a good evening, and we will see you next time.